Principle 59 Master the Spending Game Too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they don't want, to impress people they don't like. Will Rogers, American humorist, actor, and writer Make no mistake, earning millions per year, living in an expensive home, experiencing a rich and luxurious lifestyle, plus building a high net worth through extensive investments, should be everyone's financial goal. Along the way, however, it should also be your goal to become intelligent about how you spend your money. Today, the amount of consumer debt amassed by the average household is staggering. Add to that consumer debt a mortgage payment, car payment, a student loan payment, not to mention daily groceries and other necessities purchased on credit cards, and it's easy to see why most people never achieve the net worth and luxury lifestyle they dream about. They commit what little money is left over each month toward paying off the past purchases rather than toward investing for their future lifestyle. They're heavily in debt today, and they'll stay in debt over their lifetime simply because they spend more money than they make. Successful people, on the other hand, have mastered the spending game. They live below their means. They pay less for what they need. And they figure out how to accomplish what they want to do while spending as little as possible. How much did you spend last year? Ask yourself if what you're buying is a need or a want. There is a big difference. Dave Ramsey author of The Total Money Makeover. Spending too much can wreak havoc with your financial goals. It keeps you in debt, prevents you from saving as much as you could, and turns your focus to consumption rather than to wealth creation and accumulation. If you can't seem to curb your spending, try this exercise. Go through every closet, drawer, and cabinet in your house and take out everything you haven't used in the past year. This includes clothes, shoes, jewelry, utensils, consumer electronics and appliances, blankets, craft supplies, sporting equipment, games, toys, auto accessories, and tools. Anything and everything you spent money on but didn't use in the last year. Gather it all together in one place, such as your living room, family room, or garage. Then add up the price you paid for each and every item. I've encountered people who found expensive clothes with the tag still attached, shopping bags containing housewares they never unboxed, and expensive tools and equipment they literally used once, perhaps three or four years ago. The truth is that with the exception of tuxedos, evening gowns, ski boots, and snorkel gear, you may use only once every few years. You probably never really needed all those things in the first place. You didn't use them in the last year and you spent the money on them. When you add up what these items cost, you may find the total will be more than your current credit card debt. Start paying cash for virtually everything. One way to curb spending is to start paying cash for everything. Cash is more immediate. It makes you think about what you're buying. You'll probably find yourself spending less than you would if you used credit cards. Every potential purchase will be considered more carefully, Necessary incidentals will become less necessary, and large purchases will probably be put off, forcing you to think about how you can make do without them. Reduce the cost of your rich lifestyle. Another way to master the spending game is to live the lifestyle you want, yet pay a whole lot less for it. I know many people who do this all the time, yet still maintain an aggressive saving and investment program with a few simple changes in the way they spend and buy. Let's look at a few examples. A woman I know regularly purchases $685 season tickets to the opera for just $123. She sees the same world-class tenors, hears the same thunderous music, and hobnobs with the same art patrons as those who pay more to be there. But she gets her tickets at 82% off what other people pay. How does she do it? When the mailing for season ticket subscribers arrives in March, she selects the operas she wants to see, disregards those she doesn't like, and sends in her payment with instructions for her Design Your Own series, simply assuming the order will be accepted, which, of course, it always is. 
Because she is perfectly happy to sit in the balcony, she gets an entire season's worth of champagne experiences for less than the cost of a month's worth of gas for her car. Another friend is a collector of vintage cars. Not just any cars, but convertible Cadillacs. He buys them in January when no one would ever think of purchasing a convertible, and saves literally tens of thousands of dollars off the cost of his purchases. As a result of this strategy and other savvy purchasing ideas, he can afford to own several rental properties and put the positive cash flow they produce into saving himself rich. Another woman I know likes to wear expensive designer fashions, but feels morally bound to purchase them at the consignment store where she selects from racks and racks of virtually new or never-been-worn cast-offs, paying pennies on the dollar to look like a movie star. Other people barter for goods and services, ask for discounts even when they're not offered, ask how they can buy the item cheaper, call four or five vendors and take bids for the same identical item, shop at ultra-budget stores for the things that don't matter so that they can spend more on the ones that do, in short, they routinely squeeze every dime they can out of the cost of living the extravagant lifestyle they want. To these people, who are all aggressive savers, living this kind of lifestyle on as little money as possible has become a game. What will make you truly happy? That man is richest, whose pleasures are the cheapest. Henry David Thoreau, author, poet, and philosopher. Financial mentor Todd Treseder recommends that you add up the cost of all the unnecessary stuff you've been spending money on and compare that amount to what you could be spending that money for, either building a rainy day fund, enjoying rich and rewarding life experiences, or paying for things that are much more critical to your happiness. Wouldn't an exotic vacation, a virtual assistant, interesting educational or personal growth opportunities, or the ability to pursue global philanthropy, make life more enjoyable, and inspire you to achieve even greater financial success? David Bach, best-selling author of Start Late, Finish Rich, calls this prudent strategy the latte factor, the idea that if you eliminate small but unnecessary daily expenses, such as that $4 cup of morning coffee from the gourmet coffee shop, or buying lunch every day, or hitting the mall for retail therapy, you could redirect the savings into investments that would help achieve your financial goals. While these purchases might seem small, it always surprises people how quickly they add up to substantial savings. Reconsider whether you really need that student loan. Today in America, the student loans that have yet to be repaid add up to more than the total credit card debt for all American households combined. Nearly one trillion dollars have been borrowed for tuition, books, and living expenses, but have yet to be paid back. Some students graduate with $200,000 or more in debt, hampering their ability to buy a house, get married, start a business, travel, or even pursue a career they love. Instead, they're faced with moving back home, curtailing their future plans, and taking whichever job pays the most, even if it's not what they studied for in the first place. Not only that, but experts suggest that the ease of obtaining a student loan has actually caused universities to inflate their tuition and fees, knowing the costs will be easily met by students who are willing to borrow to get an education. And most lenders will tell you that a substantial portion of student loan money is spent on lifestyle expenses, rent, and other day-to-day -day expenses that don't necessarily contribute to a student's education. But before you say... Without a student loan, I couldn't go to college. Ask yourself whether you really need that loan, or need one that is quite so large. Can you go to a community college the first two years and live at home to cut costs? Can you live inexpensively in the dorms versus renting and furnishing an apartment or house? Can you become an excellent candidate for merit-based scholarships by doing internships in your field, becoming active in industry groups? creating a substantial resume or curriculum vitae, then researching less well-publicized scholarships available through private family foundations. Graduating with as little debt as possible should be the goal of every college student. Take steps now to become debt-free. 
Another big part of mastering the spending game is to simply get out of debt. Stop paying high credit card interest rates and assume a less consumptive lifestyle. It's amazing that as a population we've amassed as much personal debt as we have. Credit card, mortgage, and auto payments are staggering for many people. Savings and financial security suffer. If this is your situation, take steps now to start living life debt-free using these strategies. 1. Stop borrowing money. As simple as this may sound, borrowing money is one of the main reasons why people don't get out of debt. While they're paying down existing debt, they're still using their credit cards, taking out new loans, and so on. This is madness. Why? Because the cost of borrowing is actually more staggering than most people know. The numbers below show you how much you actually pay when you purchase an item with borrowed money. Amount borrowed, $10,000. Interest rate, 10%. Months financed, 60 months. Total interest paid, $3,346.67. Total interest as a percentage of item purchased, 33.5%. If you wouldn't pay $13,346 for the item you've just borrowed $10,000 for, find a way to pay cash for it, purchase a similar item for less money, or decide whether you really need that item at all. 2. Don't get a home equity loan to pay off credit card debt. When you consolidate all your monthly payments into a lower rate loan, you actually make your situation worse. Why? Because you start back at the beginning of the amortization scale, where interest is the highest portion of each month's payment. At the beginning of any loan, very little of your new monthly payment goes to pay down the principal, whereas the consumer loans you were paying on before may have had most or even all of your monthly payment going toward reduction of the principal. 3. Pay off your smallest debts first. When you pay off your smallest debt first, you achieve a major success breakthrough, even if it doesn't seem that way. For one thing, you experience a huge boost in your self-esteem whenever you accomplish any goal. Why not start with the smallest goal that is the easiest to achieve? 4. Slowly increase your debt payments. Once you've paid off a smaller debt, simply take the monthly payment you were making on that debt and use it to increase your payments on your next debt. For example, if by paying $300 a month on your credit card, you reduce your balance to zero, take that same $300 next month and add it to the amount you would normally make on your car loan. This saves you thousands of dollars in interest by paying off your car loan early, plus it keeps you from expanding your lifestyle by that $300 a month. 5. Pay off your home mortgage and credit cards early. Many mortgage lenders offer what's called a bi-weekly mortgage. That means you pay half your monthly mortgage amount every other week, instead of making one big payment at the beginning of the month. Because these loans often re-amortize with every payment, it has the effect of turning a 30-year mortgage into a 23-year loan. This results in staggering savings on mortgage interest and gets you out of debt faster than you ever thought possible. If your lender doesn't offer such a loan, why not make one extra payment a year or pay a small extra sum on your own every month? It will still reduce the number of years on the loan and save you years' worth of interest. You can also make extra payments on your credit cards. The Power of Focus As you commit to becoming debt-free and saving more, you'll encounter an almost miraculous force working in your life. As you change your focus from spending and consuming to enjoying the things you already have and putting money aside, you'll progress at an almost unexplainable rate. Even if you don't believe you'll survive every month, once you commit to a debt reduction and savings plan, you'll be surprised at your ability to manage and arrive at your goal faster than you had planned. You may go through a profound transformation. You'll see your values and priorities change. Suddenly, you'll measure your success in terms of debts paid off rather than goods purchased. And as your investment portfolio grows, you'll begin to weigh all purchases against your goal to be financially secure and debt-free. Regardless of where you are in life, 
Even if you're in what appears to be a hopeless situation, stay the course and allow this miracle to accelerate you to your goal. Principle 60. To spend more, first make more. Whatever may be said in praise of poverty, the fact remains that it is not possible to live a really complete or successful life unless one is rich. Wallace D. Waddles, author of The Science of Getting Rich. In the final analysis, there are really only two ways to end up with more money for investing or additional luxuries. Either spend less money in the first place, or simply make more of it. Personally, I am a fan of making more. I would rather make more and have more to spend than to always be denying myself things I want for some distant future gain. The fact is that making more money means you can both invest more and spend more on the things you want. Travel, clothes, art, concerts, fine food, quality medical care, world-class entertainment experiences, quality transportation, education, hobbies, and all sorts of time and labor-saving devices and services. This is common sense. How to make more money The first step to making more money is to decide how much more you want to make. I've talked extensively about using the power of affirmations and visualization to see yourself as already in the possession of that money. Not surprisingly, story after story exists in the world about super-rich individuals who have used these daily habits to bring more abundance into their lives. The second step is to ask yourself, what product, service, or additional value can I deliver to generate that money? What does the world, your employer, your community, fellow business people, fellow students, or your customers need that you could provide? Finally, the third step is simply to develop and deliver that product, service, or extra value. More money idea number one. Become an intrapreneur. Today, many of America's smartest companies are cultivating entrepreneurship among their employees and executives. If one of these companies is your employer, or if you can convince your boss to give you a percentage of the newfound money you generate from overlooked areas of revenue, you can almost instantly increase your income. Perhaps your employer has a customer list that isn't selling additional goods and services to. Perhaps your work group is so good at managing projects, its members have extra time that they could hire out to other departments for extra pay. Maybe there's a piece of machinery a vendor relationship, an overlooked marketing idea, or other unusual asset your employer isn't using to full advantage. You can create a plan to turn this asset into cash and approach your employer with a proposal to work on the asset maximizing project off hours for extra pay. It may even garner you a well-deserved promotion. Janet Switzer's book, Instant Income, Strategies That Bring in the Cash for Small Businesses, innovative employees, and occasional entrepreneurs. Details an entire plan for going into business with the boss, including a checklist for finding hidden income opportunities, a script for negotiating a deal with your employer, recommended compensation models, strategies that will help you generate newfound revenue, and even a comprehensive implementation guide for executing on your plans. More money idea number two. Find a need and fill it. I never perfected an invention that I did not think about in terms of the service it might give others. I find out what the world needs, then I proceed to invent it. Thomas A. Edison, America's Most Successful Inventor Many of the most successful people throughout history have identified a need in the marketplace and provided a solution for it, yet most of us have never asked what's needed or even what's possible. If your dream is to earn more money, either with your own business or in addition to your job, identify a need that isn't being met and determine how to meet it. Whether it's starting a website for a particular group of collectors, providing a unique education for people who need rare or unusual skills, or developing new products or services to address emerging trends you see in society, there are always needs you can find to create a business or a service around. Many of these former met needs are inventions and services we now take for granted. But the fact remains that people discovered something they needed in their own life 
or stumbled on the needs of others, then created the gadgets and services we enjoy today. The baby jogger was invented by a man who wanted to go jogging but had childcare responsibilities. What he created for himself was soon in demand by nearly everyone who saw it. eBay, the world's largest online auction service, was born in 1995 when founder Pierre Omidyar engineered a way to help his fiancée trade Pez candy dispensers. Avon decided that its direct selling approach was ideal for the newly emerging Russian democracy, where Avon representatives could not only act as personal beauty consultants to Russian women who were unaccustomed to wearing cosmetics, but could also serve as delivery outlets at a time when retail infrastructures were practically non-existent. Internet dating services were invented when smart entrepreneurs matched the desires and busy schedules of single people with the computer technology that was sitting in front of them 8 to 12 hours a day. After 26-year-old Nicholas Woodman's marketing company called Funbug failed in 2002, he decided to travel around the world surfing. In an effort to capture his surfing activities on film, he attached a 35mm camera to the palm of his hand with a rubber band. Seeing that amateur photographers like him, who wanted to capture quality action photos of their activities, had difficulties because they could not get close enough to the action or were unable to purchase quality equipment at affordable prices, he was inspired to found GoPro. His solution was to develop a belt that would attach the camera to the body. He and his future wife financed the business by selling shell necklaces from their car, paying $1.90 in Bali, and selling them for $60 in California, eventually combining the proceeds with money borrowed from his mother and father. The original cameras he had developed have evolved into a compact, waterproof digital camera that supports Wi-Fi, can be remotely controlled, and is affordable to the average action sports enthusiast. In 2004, he made his first big sale when a Japanese company ordered 100 cameras at a sports show. Sales have doubled every year since, and in 2012, GoPro sold 2.3 million cameras. That same year, a Taiwanese contract manufacturer purchased 8.88% of the company for $200 million, which set the market value of the company at $2.25 billion, making Woodman, who owned the majority of the stock, a billionaire at the age of 38. In the 1970s, a German forest ranger made an interesting discovery. Caught in an avalanche, he owed his survival to the dead game he was carrying on his shoulders, since it allowed him to remain on the surface of the snow. Experiments with voluminous canisters and balloons followed, and the idea for the avalanche airbag was born. In 1980, Peter Ashauer, after first-hand experience with an avalanche, acquired the patent founded the company ABS Peter Ashauer, GMBH, and started to develop a system that allowed avalanche victims to gain a sufficient increase in volume within seconds, without obstructing their ability to move. Since 1991, the documented survival rate for airbag-equipped skiers and avalanches has been 255 out of 262, or 97%. The company now has sales in 25 countries, and in the 2012-2013 season, they reported sales of 20,000 units, each of which retails for about $1,000. What need could you identify? Need is literally everywhere you look. It doesn't matter whether you are a college student seeking a summer income, a housewife wanting to earn an extra $1,000 a month to make ends meet, or an entrepreneur looking for the next big business opportunity, there is always a need that could be your opportunity to make some serious money. A fresh idea makes Mike Milliron a multimillionaire. Mike Milliron was a salesman for a label company who needed to make a few more dollars a month. One of his biggest customers was the TGI Fridays restaurant chain a sophisticated operation looking for a fail-safe way to mark their stock and ensure that employees use the oldest perishable foods first, a process called food rotation. 
Before meeting Mike, they used masking tape and markers, or they bought colored dots at an office supply store and posted a chart on the wall that said, Red dot equals Wednesday. Their biggest problem? The adhesive didn't stick in their walk-in coolers, so Mike invented day dots for food rotation. A fail-proof system of colored dots with the day of the week imprinted right on the cold temperature label. He realized that if TGI Fridays needed the dots, other restaurants probably needed them too. He began marketing day dots to as many restaurants as he could economically afford to reach. Like most people with a new idea, Mike capped his day job. With three kids, a mortgage, and two car payments, it was too big a risk to quit and devote full time to day dots. I had zero money, so I had to figure out how to take my idea to market economically and without quitting my job. That's where the mail-order idea came up. Mike produced a simple one-page flyer that explained the day dot system and financed it with a $6,000 loan against his wife's Chevy station wagon and then mailed it to the handful of restaurants for which he could afford the postage. He got just enough orders from that first mailing to encourage him to do another mailing, then another. For four years, he and his wife kept their day jobs and worked out of their house. Today, Mike's company mails three million catalogs a year and prints over 100 million day dots a week. Mike saw a need, and with the help of his wife, kids, and employees, he worked diligently to fill it. Day Dots is even involved into a manufacturer and distributor of food safety products, as well as cold temperature, dissolvable, and super-removable dots and labels. Thirteen years later, Mike was approached by a $4 billion Fortune 500 company that purchased Day Dots for tens of millions of dollars. What started out as a simple enterprise to earn a few extra dollars to get his kids through school ended up earning Mike enough to do all that and more. Mike Mill Iron noticed a need and found a creative, economical way to fill it. We the People In the early 1990s, Linda and Ira Distonfield began looking for the next adventure in their lives. They'd been successful in civil service jobs but wanted to make a change. And after looking at the marketplace, at all the products and services available, the one service they couldn't find was budget-priced legal work. It's no wonder they couldn't find it, of course. In those days, attorneys still had the upper hand and charged thousands of dollars for simple documents that might take just a few minutes to produce. A typical bankruptcy cost $1,500, and a simple divorce might run as high as $2,000 to $5,000. But what about a service, the distant fields thought, where everyday folks could get help for simple legal forms for $399 or less. What about a service that would demystify the legal process and explain a customer's options in everyday non-legal language? In a small storefront in Santa Barbara, the Distin Fields began doing just that. Their company, We the People, was born. Today, the husband and wife team have more than 150 offices in 30 states and have served more than 500,000 customers in the last 10 years, with as many as 60 different kinds of legal services, all at prices that won't break the bank. That's definitely finding a need and filling it. But perhaps the most telling proof that they found a need and filled it is the story of one satisfied customer in New York who raved about We the People to New York City's former corporation counsel Michael Hess. Within days, Hass had checked them out and passed along his findings to former New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. As a former U.S. attorney himself, Mayor Giuliani was intrigued by a people-oriented legal service that simplifies the process and charges lower fees. Today, he's a partner in We the People, bringing tremendous credibility to the distant field's dream and the industry they created. We the People has become so successful, in fact, that a major corporate powerhouse recently contacted the couple about buying them out and taking We the People to the next level. The Distant Fields' commitment to providing an affordable service to their community has now paid them back handsomely. The possibilities are endless. Do you see something you want or need in your life? 
What about a need, longing, or aspiration in the lives of others around you? Is there something that needs to be provided, solved, addressed, or eliminated? Is there something you find annoying that could be alleviated if there were some gadget or service to solve that particular problem? Do you share a common goal or ambition with others in your industry or social circle that you could achieve if only someone provided a system or process for achieving it? Do you enjoy certain activities that could be made even more enjoyable with a new invention or service? Look at your own life and ask what is missing that could make it easier or more fulfilling. More money idea number three. Think outside the box. When Dave Linegar, founder and CEO of Remax, was a successful young real estate agent, like everyone else, he grumbled about paying 50% of his commissions to the broker whose office he worked in. Experienced and an out-of-the-box thinker, he began to look for an alternative, a better way to sell homes and keep more of what he earned at the same time. Not long after, Dave happened upon a simple, independent, rent-a-desk real estate office that, for $500 a month, provided a desk, a receptionist, and limited other services to real estate agents who were experienced enough to find their own customers and do their own marketing. Like Dave, these agents didn't need the backing of a big-name entity to be successful. But unlike more professionally managed real estate brokerages, the rent-a-desk idea didn't offer outstanding management, a large brand name, lots of offices, and the ability to share expenses across thousands of agents. Why not create a hybrid? Dave mused. Why not create a firm that offers more independence to agents, that lets them keep more than 50% of their sales commission, but still provides more support than going it alone? Real Estate Maximums, REMAX for short, was born. And since its inception in 1973, because of Dave's commitment to the vision and his dogged determination not to give up during the very challenging first five years, REMAX has become the fastest-growing, largest network of real estate agents in the world, with more than 90,000 agents and 6,000 offices in more than 90 countries who share overhead, enjoy expense control, and are part of a bigger entity, but who also remain independent enough to determine their own advertising budget and decide how much of their income they want to keep for their expenses. Because Linegar's out-of-the-box idea was backed up with hard work, perseverance, and passion, and because it met a need for thousands of real estate agents, the dream has grown into an almost billion-dollar-a-year business. How far might you go if you were willing to do some out-of-the-box thinking and then take action? Money idea number four. Start a business on the Internet. As an income generation specialist, Janet Switzer works with countless Internet entrepreneurs, helping them earn more money from their online businesses. Today, an Internet business is one of the easiest to start and operate, even while you keep your current job. You can find a need and fill it for a very narrow market, yet still reach thousands and even millions of people with that special interest all over the world. Today, services abound that give you a platform for selling anything you make, find, or can do for others. Online shopping platforms like eBay, Etsy, Yahoo Stores, and others let you set up a storefront and sell items you've made or acquired, whether it's antiques, electronics, used books, or something else, paying a small percentage of each sale. The free website Craigslist, on the other hand, lets you advertise virtually any item for sale from garden plants to household items to clothing, even real estate and vehicles, all at no charge. It's the world's biggest yard sale. You provide your contact information so buyers can contact you directly, and there are even apps to alert buyers when a specific item is posted by a seller. If you set up your own website and subscribe to a shopping cart service, you can sell and accept credit cards for payment at your own site, this is where your expertise becomes valuable, selling ebooks, audio courses, training materials, specialized reports or directories, how-to information, and other knowledge products that are downloadable, meaning you never have to ship a single box or send an envelope.
Additionally, the good news is the Internet is now a mature marketplace. Hundreds of other websites, newsletters, and clubs already have visitors, subscribers, and members who could be perfect prospective customers for you, once you offer a percentage to the other website owner or affiliate. Once you learn how to market on the Internet, you can also market other people's products online. A man in Florida approached his local jeweler and asked him if he'd ever thought about selling his jewelry on the Internet. The jeweler replied that he had thought about it, but had never had the time to get around to actually doing it. He offered to build the website and drive traffic to it for a percentage of the profits. The jeweler readily agreed. It was a win-win for both of them. Shane Lewis, a medical student in Virginia, decided to create an Internet business to cover the cost of supporting his family while he was attending medical school at George Washington University. With the help of StoresOnline.com, he looked around for a product he could market and found a rapid urine drug test that parents and others could use to administer drug tests with immediate results. When this book was first published in 2005, Shane was making well over $100,000 a year from this and two other drug and alcohol testing products. He told me back then, My first month, I only had a few orders. But by the third month, we were doing really well and exceeded my initial goals. Today, we earn enough for my wife to stay home with our children while I attend school. Thanks to our Internet business, we are virtually debt-free and no longer have to rely on student loans to make ends meet. More Money Idea Number 5 Join a Network Marketing Company There are more than 1,500 companies who sell their products and services through network marketing. Certainly, one or more you can get passionate about. From health and nutrition products to cosmetics, cookware, toys, educational materials, and phone services, even low-cost legal and financial services, there is something for everyone. A little research on the Internet will yield a host of opportunities. You can visit the websites of the Direct Selling Association at www.dsa.org for an extensive list of companies. Tony and Randy Escobar decided to join forces with Isagenics, a newly created network marketing company specializing in nutrition for life, internal cleansing, weight loss, and skin care products. They had a passion for health and wellness, the desire to succeed, a love for people, a love of the products, and a commitment to work hard. Tony, an Australian immigrant who had been working in the copper mines of Arizona only a few short years before, and his wife, who were facing bankruptcy just prior to their joining Isagenics, created an income of nearly $2 million a year in less than two years. Although the speed at which they achieve this level is exceptional, millions of people are adding thousands of dollars a month to their incomes by participating in network marketing companies, and many are becoming millionaires. In fact, it has been reported that network marketing has produced over 100,000 millionaires since the mid-1990s in the United States alone. It's also reported that 20% of all new millionaires have come from network marketing. Because many network marketing companies do not last, make sure you get solid advice about the company and its products before you get involved. Find a company that has been around for a while and has a great reputation. Try the products and make sure you love them. If you are passionate about the product and passionate about people, you can make a lot of money through the leverage that building a downline provides you. There are very few businesses where you can capitalize on such a huge opportunity for such a small financial investment. Money flows to value. Wherever you decide to put your energies, the key is to become more valuable to your current employer, customers, or clients. You do that by getting better at solving their problems, delivering products, and adding services that they want and need. You may need to get more training, develop new skills, create new relationships, or put in extra time. But the responsibility for getting better at what you do and how you do it is totally yours. Always seek out opportunities for more training and self-development. If you need an advanced degree or some kind of certification to move up in your chosen trade or profession, quit talking about it and go get it. 
create multiple sources of income. The best way to enjoy greater income and develop economic security in your life is to create several sources of income. This protects you from any one of those sources, usually your job, from drying up and leaving you without any cash flow. I have always had several sources of income. Even when I was a therapist in private practice, I also gave speeches, ran workshops for educators, wrote magazine articles and books, and had a mail-order bookstore. You, too, can find all kinds of additional ways to make money if you merely start looking for them. You can work up from simple ways such as hauling trash with your truck on weekends, tutoring someone, or giving music lessons, to investing in rental properties, consulting, or marketing on the Internet. There are endless possibilities for multiple income sources. If you are a voracious reader, you could create an e-zine that includes reviews of the books you have read, with links to Amazon.com, which will pay you an affiliate fee a percentage of every book that is sold through your link. You also receive a percentage of any other purchases they might make on Amazon while they are there. I know one blogger who makes an average of $2,500 a month doing this. You can sell something on eBay. You can buy and sell art. One of my friends whose main source of income is professional speaking loves Oriental art. Twice a year he travels to China and Japan, and purchases art very inexpensively. He keeps what he likes and sells the rest for a handsome profit to a growing list of collectors he has cultivated. His travel and his own art is in essence free, because he makes a handsome profit off the art that he sells. I know the principal of a private school who does the same thing during his summer vacation with antique Chinese furniture, which he then sells out of his home and garage. My sister, Kimberly Kerberger, is best known as the co-author of 11 books in the Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul series. But she is also someone who understands the importance of multiple streams of income. When she was in her twenties, her hobby was stringing beads. But by the time she was thirty-five, she started designing more upscale jewelry and turned her hobby into another source of income. She created Kerberger Designs, and quickly became known for her one-of-a-kind pieces, and it didn't take long before they were sold at Nordstrom and Barney's, as well as a host of boutiques around the country. Kim's jewelry has been featured on several television shows, including My So-Called Life, Melrose Place, Friends, and Beverly Hills 90210, and has appeared in Vogue, L, W, and Mary Claire. And because she is my sister and she has kept her prices very reasonable all these years, I strongly encourage you to visit her website at www.kerbergerdesigns.com. If you're employed full-time, you can still make more money as an occasional entrepreneur. If you're employed and you love your job, including the steady paycheck, but you just want to earn a few thousand dollars on the side several times a year, there are strategies you can use to become what Janet Switzer calls an occasional entrepreneur. In her book, Instant Income, Janet details short-term, minimum commitment, hassle-free projects that are less involved than maintaining a part-time business year-round. For example, there are online services like Elance.com that will link you up with people who are looking to outsource various services. If you do any kind of creative work, like writing or graphic design, putting together PowerPoint presentations, or if you could use your expertise to advise a small business on a specific project they want to pursue, these services will give you a platform to discuss your skills, showcase samples of your work, bid for projects, and even get paid by the party who is hiring you. Occasional entrepreneurship also lets you pursue your passion. Like the college professor who writes articles for hire, the aerospace manager who sells Native American crafts at weekend powwows, or the stay-at-home mom who runs a podcasting website for other stay-at-home moms. It lets you make money in ways that don't feel like work. What kinds of occasional opportunities does Janet recommend? Consulting. If you have knowledge or expertise that others don't, you can earn a superb income as an occasional consultant. To best market yourself, First, determine who needs what you know and what niche markets they belong to. 
Then target your online content to reach these buyers. More about this later in the section, Success in the Digital Age. Articles, your blog, free reports, and free assessment tools at your website are good ways to familiarize potential clients with your specific expertise. Service Provider Thousands of people offer services on an occasional basis, whether it's professional organizing, tax preparation, party planning, interior decorating, weed clearing, grant writing, holiday gift buying for corporations, magic acts, or one of the hundreds of other types of services that consumers and businesses will pay for. Almost anything you love to do that is also bothersome or time-consuming to others can be turned into an occasional service earning instant income. The key to marketing yourself as a service provider on an occasional basis is to approach other providers from whom these consumers and businesses are already buying and negotiate a referral. Retail and Manufacturing These work well when you're selling highly specialized one-of-a-kind items that you enjoy making and that you can sell at a very high price, such as unique jewelry, intricate model ships, hand-tied fishing flies, couture clothing, and other limited manufacture items. Use your own website or a service like Etsy.com to feature your products and sell worldwide. An Important Distinction When you are building multiple sources of income, do your best to focus on creating sources that require very little time and money to start and operate. Your ultimate goal is to set things up so that you're free to work when and where you want, or to take time off to pursue leisure. Too many scattered streams mean that you run the risk of losing your main source of income. The two best resources I know for really understanding and mastering multiple sources of income are Multiple Streams of Income – How to Generate a Lifetime of Unlimited Wealth, 2nd Edition and Multiple Streams of Internet Income – How Ordinary People Make Extraordinary Money Online, both by Robert G. Allen. And remember to apply everything you have learned so far to creating multiple sources of income. Make it part of your vision and your goals. Visualize and affirm that you are making money from your multiple income sources. Start reading books and articles about it, and talk with your friends about it. Based on the law of attraction, you will start attracting all kinds of opportunities and ideas. Then just act on the ones that feel most right for you. Principle 61 Give more to get more. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be more food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Tithing, that is giving 10% of your earnings to the work of God, which can include charities and other nonprofits, as well as your church, synagogue, or mosque is one of the best guarantees of prosperity ever known. Many of the world's richest individuals and most successful people have been devout tithers. By tithing regularly, you too can put into motion God's universal force, bringing you continual abundance. Not only does it serve others, but it serves you as the giver too. The benefits cross all religious boundaries and serve those of every faith, because the simple act of giving both creates a spiritual alliance with the God of abundance and fosters the mindset of love for others. Tithing proves in a compelling way that abundant wealth is something God wants for His children. In fact, He created a world where the more successful you are, the more wealth there is for everyone to share. An increase in wealth for an individual almost always represents an increase in wealth for society at large. The Tithing Plan That Chicken Soup Cooked Up Tithing has certainly played a huge part of my success and the success of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Ever since the first book in the series, Mark and I tithed a portion of the profits to nonprofit organizations that were dedicated to healing the sick, feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, empowering the disempowered, 
educating the uneducated, and saving the environment. Along with our publisher and co-authors, we've given away millions of dollars to more than 100 organizations, including the Red Cross, the YWCA, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Since 1993, we've planted over 250,000 trees at Yellowstone National Park with the National Arbor Day Foundation. Underwritten the cost of building homes for the homeless with Habitat for Humanity, fed the hungry of the world with Feed the Children, and prevented thousands of teen suicides through Yellow Ribbon International. We feel so blessed by all that we have been given that we want to give back. We also strongly believe that everything we give away comes back multiplied many times over. We also tie the portion of our personal income to our churches and other spiritual missionary and service organizations that uplift humanity through doing spiritual and humanitarian work. One of the most exciting projects we've been involved in was the distribution of 100,000 free copies of Chicken Soup for the Prisoner Soul to people incarcerated in our prisons. The book was never intended for distribution in the general population. But it was so successful that soon we received thousands of requests from family members, correctional officers, and prison ministries to make copies of the book available for them. What started out strictly as a philanthropic endeavor turned into another successful chicken soup book in the bookstores. And another example of how good works come back to you multiplied. There are different types of tithing. There are two different types of tithing. Financial tithing is best explained as contributing 10% of your gross income to the organization from whence you derive your spiritual guidance, or whose philanthropic work you want to support. Time tithing is volunteering your time to serve your church, temple, synagogue, mosque, or any charity that could use your help. There are currently more than one million charities just in the United States alone that need volunteers. Think about what organizations you could volunteer your time and expertise to. His life turned around as soon as he started tithing. Nature gives all, without reservation, and loses nothing. Man or woman, grasping all, loses everything. James Allen, author of Path of Prosperity Robert Allen, best-selling author of Nothing Down and The One-Minute Millionaire, didn't always tithe. But after he'd lost everything and was down to zero, he said to himself, Wait a second. I've had so much money in my life. I'm supposed to be the guru who teaches people how to become rich. Where's it all gone? I must have done something wrong. Eventually, Bob worked his way back to prosperity. But along the way, he learned a valuable lesson. Either I believe in tithing, he said to himself, or I don't. If I believe it, I'm going to tithe every week. I'm going to figure out what our income is that week and write my check that week. As he became a dedicated tither, suddenly a whole new world opened up for him. Though his debts were almost insurmountable, he became more grateful for what he had. Soon, new opportunities started flowing to him. Today, Bob says, he has had so much opportunity, it would take him ten lifetimes to tap into it all. He believes it's that way for all dedicated tithers. But even more telling than his own story is how he inspires others to tithe. He recalls one woman who approached him and complained, My husband and I can't tithe. We can barely make our mortgage payment. Our lifestyle costs us $5,000 a month. There's not enough money left over at the end of the month. Bob admonished her, saying, You don't tithe because you want to get something. You tithe because you've already gotten it. You're so blessed already, there's no way in the world you'll be able to repay it. There are six billion people on the face of the earth who would give their left lung to trade places with you. You tithe out of the gratitude you feel for the unbelievable blessings and lifestyle you have. Bob never expects a thing when he tithes, because he now realizes the windows of heaven have already been opened to him. He tithes because he's already received the blessings. Keeping it all in perspective When you let go of trying to get more of what you don't really need, 
It frees up oceans of energy to make a difference with what you have. Lynn Twist, author of The Soul of Money As my friend Lynn Twist writes in her book The Soul of Money, it's important to consciously examine your relationship with money and to remember that while money can be helpful in many aspects of your life, the goal of amassing wealth for the sake of wealth can lead to greed, a very destructive force to yourself, your relationships, and your environment. She wisely cautions that the quest for abundance that most people get caught up in usually results in a never-ending pursuit of more. So often we think of abundance as the point at which we'll know we've finally arrived. But abundance will actually remain elusive as long as we believe we're finding it by owning or buying some expensive amount of something. True abundance, on the other hand, does exist. It flows from what Lynn calls sufficiency, having enough. Abundance, Lynn says, is a fact of nature. It's a fundamental law of nature that there is enough. But even that enough is finite, leading to our current situation where, in our quest for more, we're consuming parts of the environment at a faster rate than it can renew and replenish itself. Luckily, enough is a place you can arrive at easily and dwell in happily. And once you've arrived there, it's time to transcend your fear of scarcity, both now and in the future, and use the excess you have to make a difference in the world in whatever areas you are drawn to. The age-old maxim that money can't buy happiness is ultimately true. While earning money and keeping score can at times be exciting and sometimes even necessary, it's incredibly important not to lose sight of the bigger picture, that the size of your income, your bank account, and your collection of stuff is not what ultimately creates the amount of fulfillment you experience in your life. Making a Difference Tom, a neighbor of mine who likes to contribute quietly, loves to travel for business. He is a member of the Directors Guild of America, and at one time his contract required him to travel first class wherever he went in the world. The comfortable seat, great food, attention, and drinks was a nice perk added to a film shoot schedule. He became accustomed to all these benefits, and they became a normal part of his agenda for each job. One trip, however, took Tom to New Zealand for filming. When he landed, he asked the production manager how much a coach class ticket cost, as he was considering bringing one of his sons over. The production manager told him the coach class ticket was $1,800. The first class ticket he had just flown over on had cost $7,700. He was a little stunned, as he never considered there would be such a big disparity in prices. At first, Tom thought that if he sat in coach on future flights and had the film company pay him the difference in fares, he would have nearly $6,000 more. His mind raced to all the things he could buy for himself with that $6,000. Motorcycles, trips, and many other goods ran through his mind. Then a light bulb went off in Tom's mind. He thought about the kids he had met through the years who couldn't afford to go to college. And Tom thought that with $6,000, surely he could cover some tuition. At this turning point, Tom made a pledge to himself. He would no longer fly first class. He would fly coach class and have the difference given to him to donate to a worthy cause. The first time he did it, he paid the college tuition for a boy for the year. He was astounded. He realized that by sacrificing a small amount of comfort on a flight, he gave someone not only a year's worth of tuition, but possibly a whole new direction in life. Then, scurrious things began to happen. Tom was still meeting interesting people in coach class. The other people Tom worked with asked him why he wasn't sitting in first class with them. When he told them what he was doing with the money, some of them started to do the same. His business increased too. Was it because he was doing something good, or just coincidence? Tom is still flying coach and giving the difference in fares to scholarship funds and land preservation charities. He learned that small steps and seemingly small amounts of money can have a major impact on the direction of someone's life. With that knowledge, Tom's coach class seat is a little more comfortable. Tom's story is a beautiful illustration of the impact of moving from abundance to sufficiency and the impact it can have in the world. 
corporate giving. Corporations, too, can reap the rewards of giving back. William H. George, the chairman and CEO of Medtronic, recently revealed to a Minneapolis conference on philanthropy how his company had committed to giving 2% of their pre-tax profits. Although these tithes amounted to only $1.5 million in the beginning, the company's continuous growth streak enabled them to boost their total giving to more than $400 million, with $17 million given in one year alone. Perhaps the most impressive recent acts of giving has been the $1 billion grant by Ted Turner to the United Nations and the $28 billion in grants made by Bill and Melinda Gates through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. However, you don't have to be a corporation or super wealthy to give back to the community. Any contribution, whether it is in time or in money, will make a difference to the recipients and to you, both in the good feelings you'll experience and in the expanded flow of abundance streaming into your life.